So good morning, everybody. It's eight o'clock. And um, I'm going to start like sounding like some TV talk show or something. And it's beautiful outside. And because it, it really is. And, uh, and I love this like little coolness that we're having in the morning. It feels so good, doesn't it? Oh, my gosh. And then, of course, we get up to like 85. But that's even been feeling OK to me. And everything's so green. I noticed yesterday I took my grandson to uh, his soccer practice at 5.30 in the afternoon, and all the leaves are so new, right? They kind of sparkle. They're so new. You know, they, they, they're they new. And uh, anyway, I wax on. I just think it's it's beautiful these days, and I'm, I'm glad we're getting to see that and enjoy it. So... I'm going to open this up for any announcements so we can give people just a few minutes to get in. One announcement that I want to put on your calendar. Um, so I invite you to pick up a pen so you or go to your calendar. But um, May 8th, May 8th, um, Sacred and some other partners, I think Nami and Bridges. Are ready? That. I know I'm going to be a part of it. I'm going to be doing oh. Any conversation, but it's all going to be a, a, it's going to be a gathering of people, some panels, some community conversation on mental health in San Antonio, but brought to us by sacred.org. Um, I don't have the exact times, but I know it's all morning on May the 8th, and it's going to be at the Neighborhood Center, which is on the west side. Um, and there's, there's kind of an undercurrent, too, uh, of a neighbor theme that's kind of showing itself. So um, that one's gonna be about, you know, finding our neighbors and uh, in terms of wellness. And um, again, all I know it's all morning. I don't know if it starts at eight, 8.30, but so, till noon. And, and I can jump in there a little bit. So- Go, go Bill. I'm here. So the, uh, the event is May 8th. The doors open at eight o'clock in the morning. The content will go through noon. So we'll have some light refreshments first thing in the morning and we'll get started probably around 8.30 or so. The It's a mental health resourcing day is what we're calling it. We, we're gonna have a proclamation from the city and everything that it's mental health resourcing day. So um, there'll be three sessions, um, a session on mental health resourcing for, uh, for youth and college students, uh, and then a, a resourcing from the faith community, and then, uh, and then Anne's community conversation. So it'll be a, a three-part a three-part session at the neighborhood place, uh, which is the the, uh, the family service um, uh, place over on Rebus on the west side. So eight to noon, May 8th. We'll be sending out a registration link soon. So if you wanna sign up for the sacred newsletter, we'll be sending out the the, the registration links through there. So I, I hope just you all got, Yeah, I just got an email this last week from Dream Week already for 2025. And if I remember correctly, the the theme for this coming year is we are neighbor. We are neighbor. So um, anyway, just hearing a lot of neighbor. It's very interesting, too, if you look up neighbor and its etymology. Fascinating. You might want to take a little trip there on your Google search. Are there any other announcements that people would like to share? And Bill, if you could put that into chat, that'd be awesome. I'll do it. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> you will be receiving a news today or tomorrow from um, the city faith-based initiative, and it will have other announcements in it. Um, I think a very exciting thing that's coming up in May, 10 days after what Bill just talked about, May 18th. Uh, it's a Saturday, and I believe it's from 10 until 3. If you've never been to a TEDx San Antonio, we it is like professional. It's like the best. They really do a great job. But the one on May 18th is on compassion, caring, and community. And I don't know if you know how that system works, but they send out and ask for like applications. Do you want to tell your story? Do you want to speak? And they had 200 and 90 applications globally to come in for May 18th in San Antonio. And that's been whittled down to seven 
speakers. More. So I, I, they, I, they're going to be good, right? But it, it brings a lot of hope to, you know, yes, they are. 90 applications to think yes, about so that many people on our planet who wanted to share, you know, their story. And um, I just think I'm excited. I hope you go. Um, we have things that are at little or no cost, but they, they are tickets. Uh, and you can just Google online, TEDx San Antonio, um, May 18th. That ought to do it. Any other? We could do one more announcement. All righty then. So I want to, first of all, thank Becca Broom from the H.E. Butt Family Foundation. And not the grocery store. I think that's always helpful to know. But connected, right? Same family. Uh, but to thank up front. Becca for being with us this morning. Becca is fairly new at um, the foundation, um, but maybe not new to many of us. She's served other places uh, faithfully for the city. So um, she has, has been working with the Congregational Collective. And, um, and I've had people ask me about it. Um, and so I just was like, well, we should have Becca come and tell a whole bunch of people about it. And so, Becca, I want to thank you for sharing your morning with us. And let's try sharing that screen. We prepped before everybody. So, you know, be kind and loving and patient with the technology and the user, right? Uh, and she's working on it now. I told her she showed up all red, right, white, and blue this morning in her screen. So, um, let's help you out here. Slideshow at the very... Yeah, resume slideshow might do it for you there where it clicked. Uh, Left I'm showing the screen. See the box that's kind of highlighted in orange above the main uh, screen? There we go. Resume. That might. Let's. Yes. Did that do it? Okay. Yes, you see, this is how collaboration this. works. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I appreciate this, and um, I am excited to be here. I had put my name and phone number in the chat, but I, now it's gone, um, and I didn't press um, enter, but I will put that as soon as we start questions, um, so that if, if you have to get off early or you have follow-up, please feel free to reach out to me. I am happy to, to connect with you. Um, Absolutely appreciate the opportunity to be here to, to have this conversation. I also have um, with me, and I can't see everybody in the screen now, but I did see um, several of our churches um, and um, members of the Congregational Collective have joined this morning. So if at any point in time there are things that you would like to share as well, I want to open that space and have you um, contribute. I know I saw Braun and I saw the Bishop and I think I saw Jaime and not sure who else I saw, but I saw a couple of screens pop up. So please feel free um, to weigh in um, and contribute. I thought maybe the best way to start this would be to give some context um, in a little bit of history. Can you all see, or is this in the way here? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so actually, here we go. Um, so, you know, this has been a journey and this wasn't all of a sudden an investment that was made to start a new initiative. Um, there was a lot of uh, legacy and history to this. And so I thought it would be important to kind of go through that for many of you who may not know this, um, this story. But in 1955 uh, to 1981, this is where really the um, H.E. Butt family, so this was Mary Holdsworth, so this is Howard Butt Jr.'s mother, who was actually the first woman who was ever asked to be on a state commission. At the time, it was MHMR, and she served under seven governors, so she had quite a tenure. And so this was their first step into looking at systems, mental health systems, and the care of individuals at the community level. And she was um, instrumental in changing the direction of how mental health services were delivered across the state of Texas. Fast forwarding to 1961, to present, this is really where um, the Lady Lodge was born, but Lady Lodge was born out of 
you know, at the time, Howard Butt Jr. was brilliant, brilliant in many facets. And one of them was, of course, he grew the grocery industry. And on the weekends, though, he was brilliant and talented as well as a theologian and would spend time um, part of the Billy Graham revival movement. And he would um, be, a, he was a preacher. He was an orator. He was, um, had this incredible gift and talent to take um, theology and religion and translate that into um, how we as individuals could incarnate and um, live to our, live out God in our, in our daily lives. And it was around this time where he suffered um, a deep depression and Lady Lodge was then born and his mother and father purchased Lady Lodge, the property, and they basically gave this as a, as a gift and a tool in his hand. And early conversations at Lady Lodge were brought together with the convening of theologians and um, scientists and psychologists. And really this conversation began around how do these two coexist? And so this was really seated in early mid sixties. Fast forward um, in 2017, and as the foundation will say, we don't do anything quickly. Um, David and Deborah realized that they wanted to invest significantly in honoring the legacy of Howard Budd. And um, really what could mental health legacy look like? And so, um, and really less about the crisis response and investing in programs and systems and services. It was really more about leaning into community and how do we get at this from an upstream and preventative perspective. So here were the moments that were leading up and I won't go through all of these, but if any of these pique your curiosity, again, I am happy to share any of these studies with you. Um, but just to point a couple out, um, again, starting in 2017, this wasn't an, an, a, a journey that happened without community voice. This wasn't a journey that happened without the faith community at the table. And there was a lot of um, learnings that went along with this to kind of end up where we're at now. And a couple of big ones I'll point out is UTSA's congregational study, where it really said, you know, what is what is the appetite for this? Are you know what um, is there a need? But also, what is the capacity of faith communities in this space now to address the need? Right. And so that was pretty enlightening. And then marrying that with the Lex, the taxonomy that the Meadows Mental Policy Institute did, which was basically an inventory across the state to say who is kind of doing what in this space. And then they layered that with benchmarking who's doing what nationally, what are the best practices. And then the, the, the work really produced a body of recommendations around if you're going to get into this space, what could that look like and how would you be successful? And so that really seeded the conversation around the Congregational Collective. In addition to that, as the Congregational Collective was formed, there was a um, considerable amount of, of conversation and community with stakeholders around what does that look like, right? Um, and that really helped with the branding, the, the positioning, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but so the why though, um, the why is, as we know, right, one in five adults are experiencing mental illness. One in six youth ages of six to 17 are experiencing mental illness. Suicide is the second leading cause of death. And over the last four years, literally four years, it's compounded by 36% increase, right? So it, it's, it's a, a, you know, um, a tragedy, it is an urgency, and couple that with the fact that 65% of our church seekers go to their clergy. For, before they go at a mental health professional, they will go to their church, right? So churches are at the front door of this. 49% of the pastors say that they are rarely ever speak about um, mental health to their congregations. And 70 to 80% say that they don't even feel like they are adequately trained, but 90% of them say that they play some sort of role in pastoral care. And so what you have is a need. You have the fact that faith communities are already in the space providing mental health care services. 
And you also have this sense of vulnerability on behalf of churches to say, we don't, we don't know how to do this right and well, but want to learn and lean into the space. We also have coupled that with the fact that you have a workforce shortage. So no matter how much funding you have, you're never going to have enough clinicians. You're never going to have enough clinical settings. And then layer that with the fact that, especially with minority, minority communities and communities of color, there is a huge distrust, right, in going to clinical settings. There's a huge distrust in our medical systems. And so, but there is a significant trust in our faith communities among our communities of color, right? There is significant trust for individuals to lean into the churches and the relationships they have at a community base. And so I, I think that the conversation becomes, so how do we, how do we maximize, right? How do we, if we know churches and faith communities are already engaged in this space, then, then how do we begin to empower and work with our faith communities who are already doing this work. And so just to kind of fast forward, because I realize I'm out of time here, this is a, a diagram. I'm not sure if you can see it really well, but essentially the Congregational Collective has a lane. We're not trying to be clinicians. We're not trying to have um, counseling centers in every city, like church across the city. We're really looking at upstream prevention. Right. This is this continuum of care of mental well-being. Right. And so where the congregational collective starts is in community. Right. And so what we're doing is we're working, we're piloting. Right. I'm not talking about 100 churches. We're not talking about 20. We are on a learning journey still with eight churches across our community. Right. Of different denominations. And we're we're looking to say, what is that? What is that rubric? What is that? What is that framework that is going to allow churches to be successful in, in providing and being in this space, right? And so what we're finding is a lot of it comes down to, it's not just training, right? It's not training your one and done. It's really working alongside to build out the culture of a church, right? To create a shared language and a shared understanding around mental wellness and mental well-being. It's working in community to develop connections and crosswalks to providers and organizations and systems that are in the acute care, right? Because we know that we're not just going to, we're going to encounter people who are going to need acute care, right? But at the same time, there's a lot of individuals who are just, the world's upside down, Right? There's worlds upside down. And how do we how do we build and create the tools and 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 create a culture in churches where individuals have the skill sets to be able to turn it right side up? Right. Maybe it's it's one or two or three, four conversations, or it's a connectivity to address other issues outside of mental well-being. Maybe it's food insecurity, maybe it's housing insecurity. It's what we're finding is these are such interconnected issues. It's not an either or. And so a lot of what we're doing is providing the, the trainings, the tools um, that are allowing for this work to be done. Um, so we're partnering with eight churches. Here are the eight churches. Um, this is where they're located across the city of San Antonio. So all quadrants of our city large churches, smaller churches, some are well-resourced, some were small-resourced. And again, that's part of the study, right? Is that part of the magic rubric? Is that part of the secret sauce? Do you need to have a lot of resources? You know, and so, so what we're finding is, you know, what we're finding so far, right, is it really is more about building out the capacity and the resources of churches within, and it's a, it's a place of culture and compassion, right? And so it doesn't matter if you've got resources or not resources. What we're finding is that there is this sense of if bringing the tools to bear and providing training and work, walking alongside around how to implement and build out a culture to support the work is more important. Um, so part of what we're doing is the key elements are the clergy, clergy leadership development, right? Getting leadership engaged on the onset, 
Um, we went through a cohort selection and engagement, right? A lot of that was um, them themselves. It was a willingness to want to be part of and engaged. Some foundational training. So we leaned into two foundational trainings. One was spiritual first aid and the other was sanctuary. Both are evidence-based practices. Um, one leans more to creating shared language and a sense of shared understanding that addresses stigma, right? Having the language and the ability. The second, um, and really this compassion of care. The second is looking more at a framework that approaches this from a sense called, it's called BLESS. And it's looking biologically, your livelihood, your environment, um, your spiritual, and then also your social networks. And so it's really kind of social terms of health. How do you embrace this, not as mental illness, but as a holistic approach to addressing someone's wellness? But again, both are heavily um, layered in our biblical and faith traditions, which is what we heard loud and clear from the eight churches we're working with that was important to them. And we actually have an opportunity in the next month to pilot um, a sanctuary curriculum with a youth series. And so we're really excited about that. Um, the other is the programmatic integration. So it's not, again, not about training. We're taking intentionality and time to work with each of the eight churches to work alongside to see how does this integrate into your pastoral leadership ministries? How does this integrate into um, your, your adult ministries, right? And so again, not, it's not a one size fits all. This is gonna look very, very different in all eight churches and we're learning from that. Um, the second piece or the, la the next piece of this is layered with evidence-based trainings. And so working with um, forum communities, so four of our eight churches are going through peer support specialist training and four of the churches are going through something called Empower. And Empower is a, a evidence-based model out of Harvard Medical School that was um, 15 years of research in India that basically trained ASHRA workers, which is um, community health workers, as we know them here in the United States, on uh, behavioral activation. So it's brief psychosocial interventions, it's clinical uh, supervision. They have not launched this in the United States. They've had training, but not implementation in Dallas. So at Baylor Scott and White trained um, clinicians and community health workers, but have not yet implemented it. We will be the first to implement this. The exciting part about this, again, is not about taking an evidence-based practice and a training. It is working with Harvard. They are very interested in saying, look, we've never adapted this in a community-based setting. We want to learn if this isn't relevant, if this isn't effective, what do we need to do, right? To preserving the integrity and fidelity of behavioral activation, right? But what do we need to do from an from a, a implementation perspective to make this adaptable so that it does resonate in community, especially in faith communities? And so we're really excited about these partnerships. Um, the other is the clinical resource development piece. Again, we understand that we are going to encounter people who are beyond just, you know, mild to moderate depression. We're going to have people who need acute care. One of the things that we heard loud and clear from research and studies is that churches are disconnected from that larger ecosystem. And so we're going to lean into the space to be able to create those bridges and that crosswalk and those relationships. We're going to be um, measuring that over time to show and also um, come up with wh what is what are those elements that need to happen to build relationships between service providers and community? Um, and we're in the process of, of um, hopefully being awarded a grant from the John Templeton Foundation to put three years of research into that. Um, and the next is just a baseline survey. We are so excited. Um, maybe in uh, a few months, being able to come back and share with you the results of a survey that we've done among our eight churches. We've had over 3,000 responses. So ex just ecstatic at the response, but it really is looking at, um, again, a validation of do you go to your church and seek services and, and guidance? If so, what does that look like? And, and what is the current capacity? And we wanna measure over time through this process, has that increased? The other exciting piece to the survey is we're getting a lot of input around youth and the role of church in 
um, addressing mental wellness in our youth population. So really excited about it. Um, and then lastly, the, the closed loop referral system. So it's not just about creating the connectivity to community resources, but it's also um, looking to measure that value from a health outcomes perspective. So that is a lot, I realize. Um, these are our partners, very excited beyond just our eight churches, but these are some of our, our um, exciting partners. Again, the, it's, it's, um, we're having an opportunity to have a voice into the science components of this and being able to um, influence, right? As, as, as systems think about delivery of mental health services in community, we have a, an opportunity to be at the table to help adapt that so that it's relevant in our communities, especially in faith communities. So uh, I just wanna uh, end this with just this little video. This is a short snippet. Um, for me, this explains more than I could possibly say in words about the level and the, 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 the sense of excitement in this work. And I have people, I cannot see them, but I think they're still here who have loved to weigh in. Um, again, so much better than, than me, me talking about it. Becca, there was no sound. Oh, I'm sorry. There was no sound. We couldn't hear. Oh, no. I was talking to I'm sorry, and I thought you were hearing me. So. No. Oh, I don't even know. Well, I wouldn't okay. know how to do that part. Okay. I just assumed it was on my computer. Click on, we'll help you. Click on share screen again. Oh, my goodness. Okay. And you should see a box show up. And at the bottom left corner of that box, there should be another little box to check for sound. Um, let's see. You can do that before you click on what you just clicked on. Now go back and unshare screen. Unshare. unshare. Okay. For the entire thing. All right, hold on. All right, stop share. Okay. Okay, now click on share screen again. And then there's a, a selection box that comes up. Don't go any further. The bottom oh, share that. sound. Okay, yes. There you go. Now go click that and then go back. While she's doing that. Okay, I clearly technology is not my gift. Okay. Oh, yeah. I know, I know. But I'm taking a pause here before we go there. Um, so it's 828. And I always take a pause at this point so that um, we can thank everyone for being here. We try to get the meat of the briefing before 8.30, which we have. We're gonna hear a video in a second. And um, and it looks like we're, we're close to that. But uh, church is still isolated. Yeah. Can you pause that maybe? Um, uh, let's see, what was I thinking? Yeah, I wanted to give Becca a question to ponder while we listen to the video. And um, folks in this gathering are, pretty familiar with uh, Bridges to Care and its its work in the city. Um, and, and I have some thoughts and I've done some listenings, but there are, there are similarities, I hear it in what you're talking about. Um, so after we watch the video, if we can come back and hear what, what you see as similarities, but also how is it different? So, for those who need to leave, thank you for being with us. Next week, we're gonna be hearing from Scott Ackerson. He is with West East Design. It's an architectural firm that has a social impact studio. And they have been working with Ikea. And just around the corner, um, there's going to be a display at Ikea about what does recovery informed housing look like? 
And so that's the what the um, West East Design has been working on in their social impact is in with the newer housing that's being created, can it also be created and be recovery informed? So I'm very excited about what that looks like, what that sounds like. I'm excited to go to Ikea, you know, all that. So we're gonna be hearing about that next Thursday. So Becca, back to you, let's hear that video. Uh, Becca, uh, you're muted. I'm at least trying to help you out here. Unmute. Okay, here we go. You go. Can you hear me now? I think I think I've done this. All right. You're there. All right. If I make it full screen, I hopefully it won't. Oh, that wasn't the right one. But is that, is that okay? Can we just? It's working. It work. That works. All right. There we go. I think churches feel isolated, and they feel as though. We're just a small little community church. We don't have the resources, the ability to do this. But to have the foundation come alongside us, be part of this collective with other churches, I think is, uh, again, encouraging, inspiring. It galvanizes us. Because finally, we're understanding how our spirituality intersects with mental health. We finally are understanding the cries of the human soul in context of the Bible. Okay. Oops. All right. Is that good? Okay. It's good. It's All good. right. All right. Um, yeah, no, I am so happy to answer that question. I've actually got that question a lot and actually had a couple conversations, quite a few conversations actually with Doug around the same question. Right. Um, and, you know, a couple of things, right? One is we're we're starting with eight. We're we're a pilot. We're not in a hundred. We're not in two hundred. There's just no desire to want to kind of grow and go big. Interestingly enough, of those eight, three of them have actually been through Bridges to Care, and so I look at Bridges to Care as a lovely, lovely foundational piece. Um, and interestingly enough, um, and I think I think Veron Pastor Blue is on here. Um, I will actually lean into you, Veron, because I think you probably could answer far more than I, since you're one of the churches that that has actually gone through the bridges to care and can help with those distinctions. But again, I I think it is a lovely compliment. Um, it's it's different in the sense that the trainings that we are um, providing have leaned into are very grounded in, again, religion and biblical traditions. Again, wonderful uh, foundational pieces that Bridges to Care has provided that I think have, have proven very strong. Um, and so, yeah, I, I am happy. Veron, do you want to talk to this at all as well? I'd love to. Thank you so much, Becca. Hello, Anne. And um, I, I had the privilege of working with um, Bridges to Care when I first got to understand mental health and they do a phenomenal job of teaching us how to recognize the signs and symptoms of mental illness and i learned the language of mental illness from bridges to care heb in the collective however teaches us the spirit of mental illness how to see the person before you see their illness heb collective equips us to address and understand what is happening to the whole person, whether it's biological or livelihood, emotional, social, or sp spiritual. And so they enable us to bring change, lasting change to families, to people. So there's a language of mental health, which Bridges to Care does a superb job of doing. And then there's a spirit of mental, of mental health that teaches us how to integrate what we've learned with the lives of people, 
This is where HEB Collective thrives. And this is what brings a significant difference in our families and in our homes and communities. The vision of HEB Collective is to equip every congregation in San Antonio to be the safest place for people in our families and churches and communities. I have worked with several mental health organizations and HEB uh, Collective is an organization that actually cares and wants to, everybody cares, but they actually equip and empowers a church to be the hands and our, and our heart of Jesus Christ. It, that's a major difference between both programs and the outcomes are vitally, uh, they are so tremendously different because of the emphasis of, of the program. And so I am so thankful to, um, to HEB Collective for, for their heart, uh, for David and Perry and Becca, for their heart uh, for this uh, empowering and training and equipping churches for this most important work. So there was a question, thank you, Veron. And that, that is clarifying. There is a question in chat that links to that. It says, do you have plans to expand your efforts be beyond Christian congregations? So we're getting there, right? Yep. We actually, um, we're starting, again, this is proof of concept, right? It's a pilot. Um, the As again, like anything that the HUBOT Foundation does, it's intentional, deliberate, um, thoughtful, and we're starting with the eight churches, mm -hmm. right? And we also leaned into what the majority uh, denomination and, and, and uh, faith of San Antonio is. And so the idea is, yes, once we um, feel that we have um, something more to bring to the table and, and we've done proof of concept, we definitely, right, um, have a desire and, in, and a desire, not just in denominations and throughout, you know, San Antonio, we're hoping nationally this could play out as a model. But but I do think it's important that we um, make sure we get this right. Um, and we're going to go as fast and as slow as our partners and faith community allows us to. Um, and that's an important piece of this as well. So part of that, too, in, in what you just described. So you know, proof in the model. So one of the things that I hear and what you're talking about is, you know, taking time and analyzing. Also, one one obvious difference that I saw too are the eight congregations, they're from all over the city, you know. Um, whereas within Bridges to Care, those cohorts are in close geographical proximity to each other. So how it's constructed geographically is there's a a difference there. Um, but in terms of then sharing the model on a national level, and Peter's got his hand up too, sharing the model on a national level, if you could define, because Bridges to Care is already on a national level. So right. what's the change or information in this model right. to be shared? And then we'll take Peter, your hands up. So, I mean, I'm going to go back to something I said earlier, right, where there, there is, it is, it is a known fact, right? We all, all of us on this Zoom know how critical churches and faith communities play a role in community and addressing community need, right? And what, what is missing, right, in the larger dialogue, the larger system dialogue that brings value and um, credibility and validity to that role is the fact that there is a lack of data. There is a lack of, of model demonstration to then say, right, that this is a critical role that churches play in our delivery ecosystem. And not only is it a critical role, but I feel very strongly that there needs to be a space at the table to value the voice of how that delivery system plays out in local community. And, and that is a big piece of this, right? It, it is carving out the space and the intentionality of, of what faith communities bring in terms of 
people's wellness, community wellness and community wholeness. And I think, you know, with the John Templeton Foundation, I'm going to use this as an example, what they're so excited about is nobody's cracked the nut. Nobody's begun the conversation about how do you intentionally bridge system relationships with community-based relationships. And you, and you could layer that on schools or nonprofits, right? How do you begin to bring value to the role that community plays in our larger delivery system? And, and, and we're excited about that. It, so yes, from a national level, it's less about expanding a model and it's more about reframing a conversation and how community can engage and does engage differently in that larger delivery system. Maybe one thing too, that we need to have a conversation about, because I know in the city, we are collecting that kind of data as well. So maybe what one conversation, and I, I don't, I know that Bridges collects data. I don't know if it's that, that specific data, but maybe we need to have a conversation about where how data is being accessed and to put our data together somehow to make it even a stronger so, model right city. so so interestingly enough the data that we're collecting is not data that we're actually becoming a service line within a larger data pool that is driven by the uh, South Texas Crisis Collaborative. So South Texas Crisis Collaborative is very downstream and they deliver downstream services for, for crisis care across the board for mental health. What they're missing and the conversation they continuously have around that table, and I say around that table, is they are the proprietary hospitals in this community, the local mental health authority, the jail system, the city and the county. And the conversations they have and scratch their head around is, we need to go upstream. We need to figure out how to do that because we're, we're just, we're only dealing with the crisis. This is downstream. And we don't have the tools, the knowledge and the capacity. So they are extremely excited about us joining their effort because now we're providing them with an upstream solution. So we're connecting. I'm not creating my own database, a database and I'm not creating my own data gathering mechanisms. We're actually invited to the table to align as a service line in their bigger data system. And so we're so excited because the individuals that they focus on, right, are safety net population across the city, which is a database of over 400,000 individuals. And I guarantee you, right, looking at the churches who we're partnering with and who they serve, there is a overlap right? We're, we're in relationship and conversation with individuals that are cycling back and forth through the jail system and the emergency rooms. And now, right now, we're going to be able to build a connectivity. So when an EMS person goes to, you know, El Templo on the west side of San Antonio, and they're they're stopping to pick up Daniel, who toggles between El Templo and Haven for Hope. They're now going to be able to look into a database and say, "Oh my goodness, right? This isn't an isolated case. This individual has a connection and a relationship with a church and community." And when we had that conversation with the EMS person, he was ecstatic because he's we're like, ecstatic too. I'm just saying we are. We are doing same efforts, and I think we need to have a conversation, a bigger conversation, because we share exactly that excitement. I want to get to Peter because we have one minute left. Peter, he's been yes, patient. Thank, thank you, and, and and thank you, Rebecca. I'm I'm excited about the pilot. I've heard of it, and um, and I'm much in, in line with the conversation that we we're just having. There is, it's I think it's a, it's a partnership. I think that we started a program about a year ago. I'm in the southwest part of San Antonio. And uh, we got our program started with Bridges to Care about a year ago. And I think it's building that upstream foundation. And the pilot, I think, is really going to, I think, add the value to uh, more of that very direct uh, data gathering and, and more of that capacity building as well. But I think they work mutually hand in hand. Uh, I don't see a, a disconnect, but we do need to have that conversation. Uh, one thing, one, one of the concerns I had was, there's, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are no congregations selected south of 90, which is southwest and south, you know, the south sector of the city. Because uh, I'm in the southwest, and of course, it's not as collaborative in the southwest. And so we're striving really uh, 
diligently to try to connect and create cohort there. And um, I see you, don't, you didn't have anyone there. So I was disappointed to see that if I'm correct. Uh, but of course, I'd like to tap into the spiritual um, uh, first aid and see how we can uh, uh, participate in that, if that's something that's an option. And um, hopefully you'll redo, uh, come in with a, another pilot in the Southern sector, if that's uh, something you're looking at. But um, that's my question about the, the spiritual first aid. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. It's 845, and I really keep my promise to 845. Thank you for all being here this week, and thank you, Becca, for spending the time. We're getting clearer. We're going to keep working forward, and we're going to get stronger. Collaboration is, as we know from pro-social research, it's how the difference is made. So, um, so, yeah. so in our in our logo, you see the big C. So it's community collaboration. Uh, so it's the core of what we do. Absolutely, absolutely. Have great weeks, and we'll see you next week with Scott Ackerson and some social impact with recovery informed architecture and interiors. Wow, that sounds like the morning show or something. See you next week. Bye. Bye.